Tilder! What is this? This is the GVM150 Cobb LED series. How much does it cost? Approximately $400 for the daylight version and $470 for the RGB version. It's got a built-in Fresnel lens, comes with everything you need including a reflector and carrying case. Is the fan noise a problem in a typical filming situation where the light is about six feet away? No. It can't be powered with V-mount batteries, but you can definitely power them with camping battery generators. Do I recommend it? If you already have the light's little brother, the 50RS, then this is definitely a good light to add to your overall setup. Done! Roll that intro! What's going on everybody? You're watching Too Long Didn't Read Filmmaker, where the answer comes first, the reasons come last, but we're constantly and always still learning. So today we're going to find out whether or not the GVM150D and the 150S are going to be the right lighting solution for you and your overall filmmaking kit. I want to especially thank GVM yet again for sending me out two of these lights so I can produce a review for you. Now, these lights are different from what GVM is known for, which is generally their LED panels. So these are known as Cobb LEDs or chip on board. What's the difference? Well, when you take one of their panel lights and you shine it at an object and it casts a shadow, you'll notice that there's multiple shadows and that's because all the LED chips on the panel is spread in a very wide area, all casting their own individual shadow. With this light, the cobs, you're essentially taking all those LED chips and cramming them into a very, very tiny point. And when you blast out that much light from a small point, you're only going to really cast one shadow. So these are definitely very handy to if you want to cut the light with barn doors or cut the light in general, or even direct the light in one certain area. So we'll get to that in a little bit. Let's go through some other stuff real quick. The 150D, which is the daylight only version, at the time of this recording, it comes in at approximately $400. The 150S is the RGB and bicolored version, and at the time of this recording, it's coming in at approximately $470. In the box, you're gonna get a soft carrying case, you're gonna get the light itself, the power brick, as well as a reflector, a Bowens mount reflector. And in my case, the 150D came with a wireless remote control so that when you put it into slave mode, you can actually control the intensity as well as colors and so on and so forth. Now these do come in drawing 150 watts. That's not exactly a great indication of just how powerful it is, so let's jump over to the quick test where I would put these against its little brother, the 50RS, which I did a review in the past, link right up here. When it comes to raw output, the 150D is two stops brighter than the 150S in daylight mode, and the 150S is two stops brighter than the 50RS. So that basically puts the 150D at almost four stops brighter than the 50RS. However, keep in mind that the 50RS produces a flood beam instead of a spot beam, so it doesn't have that hot spot right in the middle. When it comes to colors, the 150S is definitely brighter, but again, it's only brightest in the center, whereas the 50RS is not as harsh in the center and provides a nice even flood of colors. This, of course, can be changed with the distance from the subject and additional diffusion when it comes to the 150S. When it comes to the 150S in terms of its bicolored mode, it's really only most accurate at the 5600K setting of daylight. Once you go down to tungsten of 2500K or even 3200K, you see this really drastic magenta tint. Whereas the 50RS, even though at 2500K, it does seem to add a little bit more blue, but at 3200K, it's pretty much spot on. In these further examples, I show just how much more power these 150 series lights have with and without diffusion. In this example with a more medium shot with diffusion in front of each light, 
you need to dial down the 150D to approximately 25% brightness to match the 100% brightness of the 50RS, giving you plenty of headroom with the 150D. When it comes to using colors and having a diffusion in front of the 150S, the 50RS can almost look similar by bringing the light closer to the diffusion, whereas the 150S needs to be put further away to eliminate the entire diffusion disk. When used in this situation, the difference between power could be debatable depending on your needs. One of the unique features of the 150 series by GVM is the fact that they have a somewhat Fresnel lens attachment already built in. And I say somewhat Fresnel because the way the element in the front, it's actually made out of plastic and it's not a true traditional Fresnel optical element. Now it does actually technically focus the light as there is a jump in intensity when you do focus it down, but it doesn't give you the traditional Fresnel focusing abilities. So generally speaking, it's kind of being nitpicky on this one. I can't really call it a Fresnel lens, but it does focus the light. So it does what it's supposed to. What I love is that they did make sure they include the Bowens mount, and this has become extremely popular with Cobb LEDs because photographers have been using these kind of Bowen mounts and all that other good stuff for, for many, many years. So you can actually buy the exact same photography attachments to give yourself more ability to have creative lighting. In terms of other controls, there are some DMXs if you want to uh, apply it into or plug it into a lighting board. And there is a wireless master and slave mode, which is awesome. So you can group a bunch of these together, use a remote or use one of the principal lights to send the signal out to each light in terms of what intensity you should be at, what hue, what hue, saturation, what have you. So the GVM 150 series is it pretty much does exactly what it needs to do. It's a very, very powerful single source light and the Fresnel and all that other attachment stuff definitely helps it distinguish it and be basically a nice companion to the GVM 50RS. But there are a couple faults here and these are little nitpicks. They're not deal breaking whatsoever, but I feel they're important for me to talk to you about. So the first thing is that you can't power these with Sony V-mount or Anton Bauer batteries. If you already have these batteries, then that could be a deal breaker for you. But for us, me, I don't actually own any of those batteries and it's not a deal breaker for me because I'd actually prefer to power these types of lights with a camping battery pack or a battery generator. So these things are definitely a little bit more expensive depending on what you're getting. But to me, I think they're a lot more useful for filmmakers that are on the go. Because not only do these have your regular AC outputs, but they also can power and your laptops, any other electronic devices up to the wattage rating. There's also USB ports so you can use them to recharge your batteries. Essentially, a V-mount can only serve a couple purposes, whether it's powering a large monitor, a couple rigs, or a light. Whereas this thing, if you're bringing them with you, not only are they gonna power the light, but they're gonna be able to recharge and do a whole lot more for you on set. So for me personally, I don't think this is a major con. It's only a con if you already have an army of V-mount batteries. If that's the case, then this light is probably not for you, especially if you're on the go all the time. Now the next thing is the cable length from the power brick to the light itself. Traditionally, all the GVM panels have only given you about three to four feet of length between these two pieces. And to me, that's not enough. I would rather, I'd like to have the power brick sit right under the light stand on the floor so you don't trip over it. But because once you put these lights on a light stand, you're generally not just using it at four feet. You're probably using it closer to six, seven, maybe sometimes 10, or you're booming it to the side and coming straight down. So GVM, what I would love to see you do in the future is actually extend this cable length to either seven or 10 feet. 10 feet might be a little overkill, but it's actually what I would prefer because I would like to have that extra length in case I do need to boom the light somewhere or somehow, or maybe I do need to have the light 10 feet high. So that's something that I hope you guys will be able to fix in the future in your other designs. But if not, then we'll continue doing what we have been doing, which is you know either gaffing it or doing something to rig it to the light stand. But please, please, please lengthen that cable for us. Now, the big elephant in the room is, all right, Jason, what about the fan noise? Well, let's take a listen. 
For the fan of the noise test, I'm going to mimic an actual setup. So this is going straight into my GH5. I'm just in my office with no soundproofing whatsoever. And the light is actually approximately six to seven feet away from the microphone because generally speaking, the light is not gonna be up close to you. And I'm not gonna put a diffusion in front of it to give it the worst possible situation for nothing to block the fan noise. So here is the room tone. The fan is still on, so here is an example of me just talking, 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 and so can you hear the fan noise at all? I'm gonna be honest with you, yes, you can hear the fan because the fans in the GBM 150 series, it doesn't have a whish sound, it has a sound, so there's actually an audible hum frequency. Now, is this necessarily a bad thing? I'm gonna kind of argue both ends here, and depending on what your needs are, it might work for you, it might not, but I just kind of want to offer you two different viewpoints. So the first viewpoint is you're at home, you're doing a YouTube show, and you're literally just using one of the rooms in the house. So in this specific case, my room over here is maybe 11 by 12 feet, so it's really not that big. At that point in time, I have to say the 150D is complete overkill and that no, 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 I would not recommend it if you are in this small of a setup with this type of lighting. So, because when you're in a small room, you're gonna hear that fan noise for sure because it's, you know, it's not far away from you. So it's gonna get to your microphone one way or another. But if you have background music in your videos, you're probably not gonna hear it all that much. And if you use one of the AccuSonus denoising plugins, it's definitely gonna take out that hum no matter what. So there are ways to combat the fan noise if you decide to use it in this environment. But I'm gonna tell you, you don't need to. You're spending money for no reason, and here's why. In my specific setup here, right here I have a softbox, cost me about $20. It offers you four light sockets, and inside I have one light bulb. It's a Philips 100 watt equivalent daylight bulb. In fact, I did a review on this in the very beginning of the channel, and this light bulb is still relevant, and I still highly recommend it. So check out that video here if you have not. So literally, I have one LED light bulb. It's drawing maybe 13 watts of power, and it's blasting out a 100 watt equivalent through a softbox, and here's my face. Over here, I have a white piece of poster board, and that's giving me a nice little bounce from the softbox to get the shadows to not be as dark. And then in the back, I have two RGB light bulbs to cast a color depending on what video I'm doing. My camera settings, they're not insane by any means. I'm using a GH5. I'm using a micro four thirds lens, a native micro four thirds lens, finally, at f2.8. ISO 400, shutter speed 160. So I'm not using some ultra F1.2, very, very low light lens with a speed booster, and I got my ISO jacked up to 1800 or 800 and just to get this from one light bulb. No, I'm very, very well within the realms of, of, of a really low ISO to limit my noise and what have you. So that's my settings. But I can hear you saying, well, hey, I don't like your setup because it's so it's so focused in. I want a big wide setup. I want a huge table. And so you can see me unboxing and everything like that. Okay, well, if that is the setup you desire in this room, no problem. The 150D actually is still complete overkill. So what I would do in that setting, if you wanna do this whole color in the back and a lot of light blasting at you, I would get two of these soft boxes, actually three even, you can get four if you want to, and buy a pack of the, the eight pack of the Philips LED for 30 bucks, and basically have those completely occupied out. So you have 400 major watts blasting here, 400 watts blasting over here, and that's gonna light up everything. And if you wanna do a colored background, Again, use that extra softbox, a third or a fourth one if you want to. Populate it with the RGB light bulbs to get enough oomph. And I wouldn't use the diffusion at that point. You could if you want to, but you don't have to. So it can really di direct a lot of color towards the back. At this point in time, the thing I'm trying to tell you is, is that 
that entire setup is gonna run you maybe about $120 to maybe $150 versus $400 for one daylight that can only serve one purpose. Those soft boxes and stuff can travel with you. You can use them repeatedly in other, in other situations. But the biggest one that I wanna to talk to you about is these don't have fans. None of them do. And they're blasting that much power where my camera settings would definitely be able to handle it. If one light bulb here can give me um, f2.8 ISO 400 on a micro four thirds lens, uh, yeah, you don't need a 150D. You don't need to spend $400. So in these kind of settings, don't get it. If you are in a major studio setting, I'm talking like a sound stage, you have plenty of room all around you, like 50 feet by 50 feet, and the ceiling is 20 feet high, maybe 30 feet, and you got a grid coming down. If you have all that space and it's all sound insulated, well, you might not actually hear that fan a whole lot. Now, unfortunately, I don't have access to a studio anymore in terms of being able to show that to you, but one of these days I will. But generally speaking, though, when you have these kind of fans, I'm gonna tell you right now, they're completely silent in those settings. And that's because on the productions I have worked on, we've, we've used 5K HMIs, like really big honking ones. And that, those ballasts, those fans, those fans you can hear. This stuff, nah, you can't hear it in that studio environment. So generally speaking, these lights with how powerful they are, and if you wanna stay in the F2.8 ISO 400 realm, I would say that if you're shooting through a diffusion material, you're probably going to put this light about eight feet away. Eight feet away, and there's no walls behind it because it's in a complete wide open area. At this point in time, the fan noise definitely becomes less noticeable. So generally speaking, in a large studio environment, even if you do recognize a little bit of that noise, again, a very basic denoiser will take that hum away easily. It's not something that I would worry about. It's only gonna be something to worry about if you have one of those one of these lights above the actor kind of close and maybe you have a boom mic right there or again they're wearing a lavalier mic at that point you're probably going to pick it up a lot easier but if you're doing a traditional setup where you have these lights eight feet away with a soft box or a diffusion shooting through and then maybe you have another one that's probably 10 feet away actually depending on your framing and that's cause uh, you're using it for a hair light i'm pretty sure almost 100%, I'm gonna say 99%, you're not gonna hear that fan noise. And if you did, you can easily clean it up with a very basic noise plugin, no problem. Now, for the, for the purists out there that say, well, the fan is still humming, I just would rather not have to deal with it. I totally get that, I absolutely get it. If you already have this light, or you're thinking about getting it for the features of using it with your other GVM lights, then I would say, at your own risk, crack it open, unscrew it open actually, and simply upgrade the fans to maybe an Octua or something else that has a much, much more silent hum. Those fans definitely exist out there. They're very popular within the computer world. And you just have to make sure that it has enough push of airflow because all of them are designed differently. So you definitely want the maximum amount of push with the least amount of sound. And at that point, you'll definitely have a very, very silent light. So what's the bottom line here? Is the 150D and the 150S actually worth it in your overall kit? I have to say, if you're looking to really upgrade your lighting system, but you don't have a major, major amount of budget, then I would say the GVM series of lights is actually a pretty good buy. Specifically, if you pair the 50RS with the 150 series, because I feel like these two lights, these series of lights is the perfect companions for each other. In fact, I would say, if you want a pretty good portable lighting kit system, I would get one, a single 150D, and then pair it up with two of the 50RSs. And this way, you can use the 50RSs either as bicolored modes because their tungsten and their daylight is quite accurate, whereas the 150S, when you get into the tungsten colors, they have this weird shift to it. So 
I would say keep the RGBs with the panels and then you can use those to splash extra light or you can use it to complement the 150D as your secondary light to fill in shadow areas. So if you're doing a lot of corporate stuff and of course some narrative works, that's gonna be fine. And in terms of powering these portably, if you're in a set where you don't actually have running power, you have a couple choices. You can either buy a bunch of NPF batteries for the 50RS panels, but then for the 150D, you're gonna to need to get at least a 150 or a 200 watt battery pack generator that can cost you anywhere from $150 to maybe even $200, depending on what you wanna get. But let's say you bought that battery pack generator for all three of these lights. If that was the case, you're gonna definitely be able to light the 50RS panels for quite long off of those one battery packs versus two Sony MPF batteries. And then, of course, depending on how much you really do, how long you need to power the 150D, whether it's at full power or not, you might need to buy some more. And I know that's gonna really, really jack up the price for the whole thing, but here's, here's again my argument. Sony V-mount batteries are good but the good V-mount batteries are quite expensive and they only serve one purpose. In this case, it's probably just going to be powering the light. But with these camper batteries, you have other outlets too. So you can actually recharge your batteries, you can recharge other stuff, all pretty much whatever you wanna do. And if you're really, really out there in the neck of the woods, you can get solar panels to recharge these battery packs when they're not being used, or you can use them in tandem. So there are a lot of ways that those battery packs are actually going to work better for you in the long run. Now, in terms of everything that you get from the light, the 150D, again, it pumps out a quite a bit of light, and I love the fact that they give you a reflector, it's got a Bowens mount, it's got a Fresnel attachment already built in. Even though it's not a true Fresnel lens, it actually still does the job and it does what it needs to do. So that's not a big deal. Because I know the next argument people are gonna say, well, the price does not seem correct because there are cheaper versions out there. I get what you're saying. Yes, there are cheaper versions out there. Unfortunately, I haven't reviewed those, so I can't necessarily say if they're better than the GVM. But I will say this, those, they come with a reflector, they come with a wireless thing, but they don't come with a case and they don't come with their own Fresnel attachment, which is approximately another $50 attachment if you buy the generic Bowens version. So you're already looking at adding $50 for sure. And I don't necessarily know how you're gonna wanna transport these, whether or not you wanna buy a very, very solid Pelican case, or you wanna buy some sort of soft case and just toss it in there. The GVM company has already provided those things for you. And while yes, if you part it out, you could end up with a cheaper setup, but this thing is already there and you don't have to do anything else extra. Everything is ready out of the box. Now, in terms of performance of the cheaper lights, if there is a time where I get sent those lights, I will definitely do a big comparison review to see if they all perform similarly, which one's actually better, and you know, then I can give you a very, very specific recommendation. Now, lastly, the fan noise. Again, if you're shooting in a very small studio space like I am, which is only about 11 by 12 feet or something like that, that the 150D is complete overkill. There's really no reason that you should need that big of a light in such a small space. You can get away with this little easy setup, which I won't spiel again, but here's the time code of where I did spiel it. You don't need that. You don't need to spend $400 for that kind of light. Not at all. If you're shooting in a studio environment, so I'm talking like 50 feet by 50 feet room or 25 by 20, whatever, you're in a very large room, you have a very high ceiling, you have soundproof and sound dampening stuff all around you, a true studio. In those cases, you're pretty much not gonna really hear the, the fan noise. And if you do, a very simple denoiser can handle it. For my purists out there, if you're really DIY and savvy, go ahead and unscrew and disassemble this thing and replace the fan with something from the from the computer building realm of Noctua. If you use their fans and make sure you have enough air pressure pumping through it, it's gonna be very silent and I think you're gonna be extremely happy. Now, I know I've been talking about the 150D a lot more than the 150S and because generally speaking, I feel like the 50RS can handle pretty much most of what you need in terms of color 
panned because the tungsten, the bicolor, the tungsten to daylight on the 50RS is more accurate than the tungsten to daylight in the 150S. The only time that I would say you would need the 150S is if you do need that insane amount of RGB lights powering through, because it does give you almost an extra, I wanna say two stops of color. Color is something that I don't use very often on my film sets. It's usually tungsten or daylight and I kind of mix the two. But if color work is really, really prominent in your style of filming, whether it's movies or music videos, then I would say maybe you do need a 150D, a 150S, and then a 50RS to complement either one in terms of needing a little bit of extra light. These setups between these three lights can complement each other very, very well. It simply has to depend on what type of stuff you shoot, how often do you shoot it, and what your lighting setups are. So, huh, long story short in this whole thing, yes, I do recommend this family of lights, and simply pick accordingly. And hey, that is it for this week, everybody. If this video has made all the influence in your purchasing decisions, I would truly appreciate it if you check out my Amazon affiliate links down below. Again, this costs nothing extra to you. It just gives me a little compensation so I can continue making videos like this for you. And as always, if you have any questions or comments, go ahead and leave it down below. I will get to them as fast as I can. And until then, like, subscribe, and share, and I'll see you guys in the next one.